<laughs> Hi, so hello again. Um, my name is uh, Brian Briggs. And uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thanks to Simon and uh, Daniela and the Cathay team for, for putting together this event. Uh, we're looking forward to, to kind of having a conversation. I think this is um, a small group by design so that we can um, answer questions and have some back and forth. Uh, you know, we'll start with uh, with a short presentation um, and uh, tell you a little bit about about Laie and um, uh, and then look to to kind of hear some of your questions and hopefully um, answer where we can. So uh, I'll start to share my screen, but as I'm doing that, I'll also introduce myself. So I am uh, the uh, vice president of strategy and product marketing at um, at Laie. Uh, I've been at Laie for a little bit over one year. And uh, prior to LIA, I spent um, seven years uh, working for an intelligent automation software company. Uh, and then prior to that, I was in management consulting for, for seven years, focused on, on operations and process improvement. So much of my background is around how to uh, make operations more efficient, essentially, and, and finding ways to do that uh, within our organizations. And um, you know, at LIA, one of the big things that we see is that uh, operations and, and technology and the way that people work has just changed dramatically. Um, so much to the point that we would say that the future of work is here, um, not just uh, in the future, but it's here today. Um, so with that, before I jump in, just can everybody confirm that they can see the screen and everything is, is looking okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Excellent. So, you know, we talk about work changing, and I think we see this in the news, we see this, you know, everywhere, we hear from other people that work has changed, but, but what does that really mean? And ultimately, you know, we look at work changing from a functional perspective, from an emotional perspective, and ultimately that it's changed irrevocably to the point that it will never really be the same again. Uh, and much of this really started before the pandemic, right, with the rise of new technologies, new capabilities, people expecting more from work. But ultimately, I think what most people can attest to and what Gartner specifically said is that the pandemic brought the future of work forward to today. Ultimately, it collapsed maybe 10 years of, of change into about two years. And, and this, this collapse has really resulted in a, a level of disruption and business risk not seen in generations. And so at LIE, we sought to try and better understand this change, to, to better understand you know, what has actually changed and why potentially. Uh, and so what we did is we worked with Coleman Parks, a research agency, to commission a survey. And uh, we, we launched this survey uh, in Q3 of this year. The survey went out to over 1,300 different respondents uh, across seven different countries. And we really tried to target you know, six key vertical industries and uh, C-level type personnel in medium to large enterprises, you know, those individuals who are managing, um, managing entire business units, managing operations teams, um, managing uh, technology, uh, the, the chief data officers, and uh, to really understand from their perspective what, what has changed. And so in this survey, you know, we, we asked them a variety of questions. And, and one of the first questions that we asked was, you know, whether they had seen uh, any of the following changes in their work environment as a result of the pandemic. You know, was it more difficult to attract the right skills? Um, are people tired of doing repetitive tasks? And are people maybe having some increasingly negative work attitudes, which could be impacting business productivity? And the answer was essentially a resounding yes, right? We, we saw this kind of across the board. Um, and, and as we, we look at the labor markets today, it's probably no surprise um, that it is very difficult to attract the right skills. You know, we see that there's a very tight labor market today, and, and this is ultimately going to continue. Um, that is to say that, uh, many people will continue to be looking for new roles, maybe more fulfilling roles, um, and, and oftentimes those roles are unfortunately going to be outside of your organization, not necessarily just a change within, within the organization. Um, to that point, we saw that over 40% of employees are roughly looking to search for more fulfilling roles. Uh, 
Uh, and that number is even more pronounced in key markets like the United States and the United Kingdom, where you see 44% and 54% respectively looking for those uh, new roles. And, you know, the resignation piece is one part of the problem, but what we hear more frequently from, from different uh, business leaders is the problem with quiet quitting. And if I were to sum up quiet quitting in a sentence, what I would say is that quiet quitting is when people don't actually leave the organization, but they leave it mentally. Um, and, and this obviously can create a number of problems, you know, from, from lack of motivation um, to, to reduced business productivity, like you see here, 62% reporting of reduced business productivity, uh, which then ultimately results, results in slower company growth and a loss of revenue. Uh, and, and many of the leaders we talked to, I shouldn't say many, 25% of the leaders that we talked to felt that they were falling behind the competition because of this kind of impact of quiet quitting and the great resignation. And so, you know, as a result of this survey, we felt that there was ultimately a gap. And this gap is a work execution gap between what work is and what it should and could be. And so this gap exists on a few different levels. You know, this gap can be defined, you know, from a human perspective and also from a digital perspective. So when we talk about the human perspective and we look at people related type gaps, you know, typically what we see is a lack of of sharing and updating of both work and IT knowledge. You know, many people are still working today the same way that they were in previous decades or even generations, it hasn't evolved in the way that we might expect it to. And we see this challenge not just across operations personnel or not just across citizen developers, but also seasoned developers and users as well. Uh, and, and what it really means is that there's been, from a work perspective, an inability to harness uh, these work processes uh, to work more efficiently together. And, and typically what we see within, within the kind of process world is that many processes have rapidly changing KPIs and that any, any previous automation just can't keep up to, to these changing business KPIs. And this kind of brings me to the, the digital gaps. So we have more systems now than ever, um, but typically what we see is that our systems don't really talk that well to one another. And you have information in one system that needs to get to another system, or you have to have these systems talking together, and, and they really aren't. Uh, and, and one of the, the challenges is that they were built, you know, in a prior age, but also that they, that they need a more integrated, interoperable platform. And many people have, have worked to, many companies have worked to harness the data within their organization, but... And they've been quite successful when it comes to harnessing that structured data, but there's also semi-structured data, unstructured data like documents or conversations, um, images that just are, are really kind of out of the grasp uh, for most companies today. And, and all of this data is, is not being leveraged to the extent that it could be within these organizations created kind of a data related gap. And so, you know, ultimately, what we, what we think about when we think about this work execution gap and the core issues, it, it really all comes down to employee productivity, right? There are too many manual tasks. There are many roles with tasks and processes that are um, unfulfilling. Uh, you can see vital tasks um, are demotivating in many cases. Uh, and, and then there's these complaints kind of range across the board about the repetition in, in the work. Uh, and much of this, this work can ultimately be, be automated. Uh, but in the end, right, there are massive implications for, for businesses. You know, what we see is that productivity rates have dropped and continue to drop, that employers and employees are frustrated. You know, loyalty is low, as we talked about with the resignations and the quiet quitting. Uh, labor costs are, of course, rising. Uh, and as we've seen in the news, inflation certainly isn't helping on that front. Uh, and that the actual amount of technology adoption of, of AI and automation has been lower than expected. expected. Uh, and partially that's due because the current technologies really don't meet the expectations of the companies. 
All this to say that legacy automation hasn't been able to close the gap that we see today. And, and why not? So I, I covered some of the items before, but first and foremost, what we see are high integration costs across the board. I talked about the variety of different tools uh, and getting those tools to talk to one another is very difficult. And what it means is it's a very much a maintenance headache and nightmare over time. And so typically what companies have decided to do is they've decided to um, create some automations uh, where they can kind of collect the low hanging fruit. And typically what this results in is, is what we call islands of automation, where a portion of the process is automated, but the full end-to-end -end process uh, hasn't been really tackled in a sufficient way, which is then creating more gaps between people and technology. And lastly, that the, a lot of the, the opportunities and tools and systems that we use are, were really built before the AI boom. Uh, I think many people, uh, you know, if, if you're like me, you probably saw the, the recent release of the chat GPT-3 capabilities from OpenAI, and the chat functionality is, is astounding, for, for lack of a better word. It's a, it writes like a person. It can be done entirely through, through AI. Um, and many of the tools that we're using in our organization don't have that type of intelligence built in. They're just simply not intelligent enough which is creating more of these gaps. And so we looked to, to incorporate a solution to bring these uh, gaps to a close. And that is the work execution system, which ultimately looks to close the gap between human and digital work. And what you see here is there's kind of four components to the work execution system related to an ecosystem of, of implementers and users, a platform, which is the technology component, metadata, which helps to uh, actually ensure that we're getting the best information out of your proprietary data, but also uh, external data, and then enabling workers to, to kind of have be higher up in the value chain with all of this work. And LIE has a bit of experience doing this. So I don't, don't want to make this too much of a sales pitch, but just to kind of um, uh, share some credibility, uh, typically, in a, in a standard year in 2022, uh, LIE's customers automate about 180 million conversations, 60 million hours of repetitive software operations, and 110 million pages of documents. And we do, with, do this with some of the world's leading organizations. Uh, you see Nike, Johnson & Johnson, uh, AstraZeneca, I'll share a short case study later, uh, Eurostar for those of you traveling between uh, France and the UK frequently. Um, much of these customers uh, have turned to LIA to help solve some of their most critical business problems. So what does the technology component of this actually look like? So we call this the work execution platform, which really brings together RPA or robotic process automation, which some of you may be familiar with, which essentially helps to connect systems to one another. Intelligent document processing, which, help, which helps to manage unstructured data. And then an AI chatbot, which can in real time manage free flowing conversations uh, with customers or internally. And so what I have here is a short video that actually shows how these three components come together in a seamless system to create a digital worker. So I'll start playing the video, but if you can't hear it, please just uh, ping me. Digital workers should enhance both your customer's experience and your employee's experience. Take this example of how digital workers process insurance claims. The customer visits ABC Insurance's website and interacts with a digital worker through chat. The customer asks to submit a claim and is informed they will need to submit a copy of their passport, travel insurance certificate, and medical report. All of this can be easily uploaded through the chat window. The digital worker conducts an initial sanity check of the documents and discovers an irregularity with the customer name. The customer can service this issue themselves and quickly fix before the claim is submitted. The submitter can wait for an instant response to their claim or can enter an email address or phone number to be contacted at a later point. In this case, the digital worker dispatches an email to the claims department to approve or reject this claim. 
If your business allows, the digital worker can entirely approve and reject on its own. The operations staff member picks up from where the digital worker left off. They review the documents and have the option to approve and pay the claim or escalate to a supervisor. LIA's work execution platform provides companies the flexibility to design business processes to their specifications and risk tolerances. For example, you could employ a maker checker before paying claims over a certain dollar threshold. Here, we see an operations manager being notified of the open claim and ultimately approving. This approval remobilizes the digital worker who now must enter the data from the claim into the system to ensure it's logged and will eventually get paid. Now, the digital worker just has to inform the claimant. Text message sent and the job is done. Meanwhile, the digital worker could have been helping dozens of other claimants simultaneously. Digital workers make work better. Okay, thanks for listening to that. So you, you might have recognized the voice in my um, uh, side job. I moonlight as a as a voiceover specialist and and video creator. So um, thanks for thanks for indulging me there. Um, I, I did want to come back to actually the kind of core piece of the video, right? So what you saw there was a chatbot that was enabling uh, better customer interactions on the front end to file a claim. Uh, after that. Uh, IDP automatically grabbing the documents and extracting the key information from those documents and the ability to then immediately process the documents and or to bring in a person into the process to ensure that you, you maintain high quality in your process SLAs, maybe certain things need extra review, maybe certain claims are of higher dollar amounts, whatever it might be, you have the ability to seamlessly integrate people into the workflow along with the digital workers, kind of creating that um, co, uh, co dependency or, or, or kind of ultimate benefit between people and, and digital work. So the ultimate vision of the work execution platform is to be able to automate any work on any system in any data for any employee. And so uh, I showed you an insurance example. I'd like to show you just a few more examples to maybe get you thinking about uh, other places where this type of technology can make an impact within your organization. So first, uh, I'll start with JDL Logistics and their reconciliation process. So their challenge was related to invoices from their delivery suppliers. Now, everybody's familiar with an invoice. Um, most invoices look similar, um, but they're different. And uh, while they have constant uh, types of data points that need to be collected, uh, they're never really in the exact same place. And so what results is that you typically have an operation where people are looking at an invoice either on a screen or on a piece of paper, and they're then typing that into the system. They're then matching that delivery um, uh, invoice to the original order invoice, making sure that it's the same. And as you can imagine, because this is being done manually, it's prone to a lot of operational errors. So what we sought to do was essentially to automate this process uh, from end to end. So from when the time the delivery invoice is received, we started by digitizing that invoice, then ultimately automatically comparing that uh, digitized uh, invoice to the customer orders in the system revising and aligning those customer orders, and then ultimately processing those, those invoices. And this case had a lot of success. You know, what we saw was that you're able to uh, cover 100% of the total invoices, but that doesn't mean that there was zero work to be done. There's still some work to be done, as you saw in terms of managing exceptions in the insurance case, um, but what was what was actually uh, witnessed in the in the implementation was a 60% reduction in kind of the amount of manual handling time or the amount of manual work recorded in the process. Um, on top of that, there was a 20 times faster processing time, which essentially means that instead of you know these invoices sitting in the queue for days or maybe weeks, they were being addressed in the same hour in which they came in, and this was able to be done with the 0% error rate. And to just give you a, a sense, this implementation took about 10 weeks. So most of the projects, I think, you know, can be done within, within the same quarter of when you start. In the second example, I'd like to talk about Wizair. 
So for those of you uh, who are not familiar with Wizz Air, Wizz Air is a uh, low cost uh, airline in Central Europe that operates um, primarily out of Hungary, um, but have, obviously has customers across Central Europe where there are many different languages typically used. And Wizz Air wants to kind of meet their customers where they are to be able to have them speak in uh, their local language. And they found that they were receiving thousands of messages per day from their customers. And so they worked with us to build a, a chatbot in their customer service department that would basically be able to take a lot of the um, repetitive questions, um, but ultimately uh, reduce the amount of work and change the way that they manage their customer support process. And today, the chatbot handles approximately 2 million messages per year and automates around 92% of those uh, inquiries and does this, of course, on a 24 by 7 basis across seven different uh, languages. And lastly, I mentioned that we would talk about AstraZeneca. Um, AstraZeneca, as you know, is uh, one of the world's leading uh, life sciences companies, and uh, they had a big challenge when it came to cutting compliance costs. And so ultimately what they wanted to do is they, they were required to answer medical staff questions when they were doing a testing for, for a new drug or something of that nature. And they, they only had a small team of about a dozen responding to these 8,000 medical staff. And uh, what they found is that 80% of the inquiries were, were basically repeat questions. And so what we worked with them to develop is basically a giant repository of all of the answers to these questions, and then deployed a uh, digital worker to, to respond to uh, these queries automatically. And um, it was then available to the 8,000 staff. They could just quickly um, send a question, the chatbot would respond, uh, and the accuracy rate was over 90%, driving costs down by 50% over those three months. So um, with that, I think we've given a few examples of where um, of what the work execution gap is and how that gap can be closed you know within specific kind of real world business context. So thank you for the time and uh, I look forward later to answering any questions that you might have. Thanks, Brian um, for that presentation. Bringing on Vinay uh, from Scan. Uh, please, Vinay, floor is yours. Yeah. Thanks. Uh... Just sharing my screen. Please let me know if you can see my screen. It's great. Okay. So just a quick introduction uh, to start. Uh, my name is uh, Vinay Momigati, and uh, I work as uh, Executive Vice President of Strategy and Customer Transformation at uh, Scan.ai. I've been with Scan for over eight months now. And uh, prior to joining SCAN, I spent the last 15 plus years working for major enterprises like um, LexisNexis, a global data analytics firm, Bank of America for seven years, where I was heading the enterprise automation and process excellence, and United Healthcare. So pretty much most of my experience has been centered around uh, establishing global centers of excellence for intelligent automation and process excellence and continuous improvement. and uh, my journey at SCAN is shifting to the other side of the world where I'm now focused on uh, technology and how to enable global enterprises to accelerate their automation discovery and business transformation. So we'll look more into um, how SCAN does that. A quick introduction about SCAN. Uh, SCAN is uh, uh, at the heart of solving two biggest problems that every enterprise is faced today. One part of the problem is about how humans work. And uh, the reason this uh, aspect of how humans work is very important is most of the costs, compliance, and customer experience problems are logged into how humans are engaged as a part of the business process. And that comes to that brings us to the next step, which is how our processes are working within an enterprise. So between how humans work and how our processes are structured and how they deliver value, Every enterprise has struggled today in terms of managing their costs, compliance, and experience. SCAN is exactly at the heart of trying to solve these two problems by bringing in data-driven discovery of how humans work 
and uh, how processes are executed and representing them in the form of data and models so that uh, every enterprise can look at understanding their processes and human interactions while delivering business efficiencies. Um, one of the big differentiators for SCAN in the market, we, we will find different uh, technologies who are trying to achieve the same kind of process intelligence objectives. But the biggest difference for SCAN is the speed to market. An average delivery takes about 10 weeks for SCAN, whereas other vendors take more than uh, six to nine months to achieve the same level of outcomes. And secondly, we don't have to integrate with any of the backend systems, which is one of the big challenges, as you all will appreciate. So today, SCAN has um, the privilege of working with uh, some of the largest names in the banking, financial services, manufacturing, healthcare sectors. And um, we, we have pretty much touched all aspects of a value chain, all the way from order to cash, to inquiry to order, to trouble to resolve. Uh, in terms of our business process exposure. And SCAN is backed by some of the best names in the private equity and venture capital firms. And that gives us uh, not only the visibility and, uh, and today's event, um, we are deeply thankful to Cathay Innovation for inviting us to the session. And uh, it's a great partnership we are having with Cathay and team. So let's look at how SCAN operates. Um, so, when we look at a typical operations, we see large uh, number of operators sitting and uh, in taking orders or uh, performing resolutions or handling complaints. So this is where we see the biggest problem is in terms of uh, understanding how humans work and how the business processes are executed. So SCAN, as I mentioned earlier, um, is a zero integration technology and, and powered by artificial intelligence and deeply focused on privacy and security. So SCAN begins by deploying virtual process agents on the operator desktops. Now these agents are operating in a silent manner with zero interruptions to the operator's day-to-day -day work. And as these agents are performing, they collect data on how humans interact with different applications, data, and systems. And this data is collected at the, uh, at the server level where we apply artificial intelligence in terms of not only extracting, transforming uh, the data that is collected, but also applying uh, predictive, prescriptive, and descriptive intelligence that will generate various types of uh, outputs, which become the feed for um, all kinds of transformations that an enterprise can undertake. So this is the complete ongoing kind of continuous monitoring that SCAN operates in. And uh, the output that SCAN generates is uh, a direct feed into undertaking various types of transformations, be it at a process level, be it at an automation level, or at workforce intelligence and uh, the future of work design standpoint. And we'll look at how are these transformations achieved as we go forward. So the key insights generated by SCAN can be looked at four broad categories. The first area is the ability to understand how processes work. So when virtual agents are collecting data, SCAN is constantly calibrating and mapping these events based on the timestamps, the type of activities performed, the type of data handled to generate an end-to-end -end view of the business process. Now, this is a key value because most companies do not have a data-driven view of their business processes. And when you don't have these business process views, um, when we undertake automations, as our um, uh, friend Brian was explaining earlier, uh, many times when we, we go with a presumed view of the business process and automate, we might realize that, oh, we didn't actually automate the real process, but we automated a presumed understanding of the process. And that is where most automations fail today. And now when we have the data-driven view of the business process models, it becomes very easy for us to understand one is what is the real problem we are trying to solve for? What pattern of automation we should apply? And that is one of the big value that SCAN generates. The second aspect is a workforce utilization. Now, when we look at workforce aspects of it, in, this is where we go deep into how humans work and understanding one is the utilization aspect of it. Second is the productivity. Third is the training needs. And this is where we talk about the future of work design where employee experience becomes of utmost importance. Because when we don't understand what causes humans experience challenges, 
we don't know um, what is causing the churn and attrition in our employee base. And then we look at uh, automation discovery. And this is another great um, uh, enabler for large enterprises when uh, you look at uh, applying automation technologies like artificial intelligence, robotic process automation. But beyond a point, you cannot discover with a human-centric way on where to apply automation. And the way SCAN works is we not only depict the end-to-end -end view of the process, but we can also generate a heat map of what parts of the process are ripe for automation, what patterns of automation are suitable for each type of activity. So as you can see, uh, this is the kind of depth that SCAN goes into in terms of the heat map generation for automation discovery. And then there is a management uh, enablement tool called unit cost analysis. Now this is uh, beyond workforce intelligence, beyond process intelligence. We go down to the level of understanding what is the cost to serve a particular type of customer segment, a particular type of products. And this is, um, this is one of the great tools that we have seen our chief operating officers and chief finance officers look at SCAN in terms of understanding not only the cost to deliver, but looking at how to optimize my pricing models in terms of maximizing profitability. So these are the broad parameters in which SCAN operates. This is just an indicative sample, but uh, based on how SCAN works, there is um, no limit on the type of configurations, analytics that we can generate by not only looking at out-of-box data, but also looking at how SCAN can marry the data with enterprise data like uh, coming from system of records or um, other master data sources. So before I joined SCAN, I was working as a chief automation officer at one of the largest uh, uh, legal analytics and data products company. Um, I didn't mention the name of the client here, but it's uh, LexisNexis, um, which operates in more than 100 countries. And um, uh, LexisNexis serves um, more than 100,000 global corporations, uh, governments, and uh, both government and non-government sector organizations. So at the heart of LexisNexis value proposition is um, not only collecting one of the largest uh, databases of legal information, but its ability to productize the legal data, which serves most of the law firms across the world. Now, the key challenges that LexisNexis was uh, trying to solve is one is in terms of customers' demand for uh, uh, self-service. I mean, with the emerging digitization across the board, um, majority of the customers want to handle uh, whether it is ordering a product or uh, uh, fixing their account issues and maintenance. They don't want to really pick up the phone and talk to uh, the call centers. So how do you enable uh, digital self-service for the, for, for the customers? The second is ongoing demand on improving profitability. Now, this is a constant demand from the investors and the board that how can you continue to improve profitability while our revenues are uh, almost stagnant in terms of the growth rate. And the third is emerging regulatory technology companies, fintech companies who are trying to enter this space and how can we be more nimble, agile and deliver faster, um, newer products to the market. So that has been a big challenge for LexisNexis. So at the heart of what I was performing as a chief automation officer was to address these business demands not only in terms of generating automation opportunities, but by bringing in process automation, process discovery, and process excellence that can create a foundation on which automations can be built. Now let's, uh, and as a part of the journey that I undertook at LexisNexis, I did a enterprise evaluation of uh, various process intelligence technologies, and I selected SCAN amongst more than 10 products and successfully deployed SCAN for more than one and a half years. So while I'm working for SCAN today, I'm presenting a case study where I was myself a customer of SCAN for over one and a half years. So we'll look at four use cases at LexisNexis on how SCAN was able to deliver value. Um, so the first one is about the editorial operations. And as I mentioned, LexisNexis is a data and analytics company. So at the heart of what LexisNexis delivers for its uh, uh, customers is the content and the products that are created out of the content that is collected. So one of the big challenges LexisNexis was trying to address in their editorial operations was, one is how to continue to deliver more 
uh, throughput while maintaining the headcount. There was a, a, a strong restriction on increasing headcount because of the profitability concerns. But based on the constant demand from the customers, LexisNexis was supposed to produce more products from the content that was being collected. And for that, uh, SCAN was deployed in the editorial operations. One is to understand how the processes work because it's a largely a manual process with high-end legal editors performing the uh, editorial uh, enrichment, data productization at a global level. So understanding the products was, a, understanding the process was a key requirement. Second is understanding the bottlenecks on why does it take so much of time to process a particular type of product or creating a particular type of uh, enrichment and going into the root causes of this uh, particular process. Third is to understand how we can apply automation. And here the focus was on applying artificial intelligence to, um, uh, to create more of um, uh, you know, automation in the editorial processes like annotations, summarization, or uh, understanding uh, uh, named entity extractions, et cetera. And lastly, it is about variant analysis and process standardization. So the output that SCAN generated was uh, providing, uh, finally enabled this particular group to improve 20% uh, in terms of the production volume. So um, as we are looking at about 2 million plus legal documents uh, that were being generated each, um, uh, each year, um, once we understood what are the uh, critical bottlenecks and uh, identified the automation opportunities, we were able to deliver 20% improvement in the overall production volume. And secondly, we identified more than 20 automation opportunities using deep learning, machine learning, and computer vision technologies that deliver $2 billion worth of annual cost savings in this group. <clears throat> in this group. Let's look at another use case. And this is in the intellectual property uh, business of LexisNexis. And here, the customer is the US government. Basically, uh, LexisNexis is hired to process patents um, that are generated by the US Patents Office. And um, we are the sole sourcing company in terms of um, content enrichment, publishing, XML conversion of all the patent documents. And the key challenge here was to understand um, why is the overtime costs continuing to increase while the, cap while the volume of patents that we are processing has almost remained constant? And secondly, it was about trying to observe, monitor, and benchmark the remote, work, uh, remote workers who are spread across more than 20 odd locations across North America. So with this background, SCAN was deployed in terms of understanding the workforce productivity, utilization, bottleneck analysis, and finally, when uh, we delivered the outcomes and we took various transformation initiatives, uh, LexisNexis was able to deliver 40% improvement in utilization rate. And this was primarily done through identifying the wait time across different steps in the process. And uh, second was about uh, the uh, average process turnaround time reduced by almost 30% uh, uh, from 16 to 12 hours. And uh, more importantly, we were able to monitor the remote workers spread across different parts of US in terms of understanding how they perform work, how to benchmark it, and that contributed directly to 25% labor cost reduction. Just a couple of other use cases with different scenarios. So this is about the customer setup process. And uh, basically when LexisNexis sets up a new customer, they go through, one is not just uh, establishing the credentials, establishing the customer records, but more importantly, how LexisNexis brings together different products and offers these products to these uh, customers. And that is where royalties and compliance becomes a critical element during the customer setup process. So the key challenge here was, there were 16 departments that had to be involved in setting up a customer. And this is not just a one-time activity, but an ongoing activity. So the way SCAN was deployed across all the departments, we were able to map the process, understand where uh, the handoffs happen. And uh, secondly, it was about trying to create an auditability so that if there are any compliance issues, we should be able to report with complete trace of who did what at what part of the process. And um, basically, the final efficiency is delivered as a part of the customer setup process 
One is we reduced the handoffs between different teams. There were a lot of redundant handoffs which were identified during scans process monitoring that resulted in 30% turnaround time reduction. And secondly, there were a lot of errors being uh, introduced because there were so many handoffs across 16 departments. And when SCAN was able to map the exact root causes of these errors and rework, um, we were able to reduce the percentage of rework by 25%. And third was the skills of the employees. We identified areas where we looked at uh, different levels of employee trainings needed, and that improved uh, the time to proficiency by three months. And there's the last one, which is uh, a new account opening for the print journal subscription business, where the focus was on achieving cost reduction, service level improvement, and then improving revenue cycle time. Now, this is where we shift from cost to revenues in terms of onboarding a new customer and new account opening. And uh, the final results helped us to uh, uh, reduce the account setup time by 50%. And when we reduce this by almost 20 hours, that is the um, improvement in the revenue realization. But more importantly, from a customer experience standpoint, the customers are able to access the product that much faster. And we also could optimize the headcount by 20% through the process optimization and introducing automations. Um, so these were the four key uh, examples I wanted to share from my LexisNexis background and experience on how SCAN delivered value. We are open for any questions. Thanks, Vinay. Um, awesome. Brian, if we can have you come back on as well, too. Uh, fantastic. Um, I think we've gotten a few questions that come in through chat um over the the course of the presentation thank you both brian and Vinay for that um kind of help kick start the conversation about how enterprises are leveraging automation better um you know i i think you know one of the things um that'd be great to talk about um brian that you alluded to a little bit uh, was around the work execution gap um and i think Vinay, you touched a little bit about maturity of organizations to, to leverage automation as well too you know um you know, as uh, coming into 2023, as we have a number of executives here thinking about, you know, where they are in that automation journey, can you talk a little bit about some of the customer, the culture and the maturity needed of these organizations to really take advantage of some of these solutions? Maybe um, I'll start with uh, you, Brian, first, um, and then Vinay, you can come in afterwards. afterwards. Yeah, sure. I think, um, you know, culture is obviously a critical part to, to every organization. I mean, when we're looking um, at, at diagnosing companies, uh, kind of where they are on the, the quote unquote maturity model for, for automation and for, for implementation of technology like this, uh, you know, we typically start by by looking at their, their operations and potentially other technology deployments that have been in, done in the past. And what we see is it, it really varies um, from, uh, from different departments, right? The operations teams, you know, that are, are closely embedded with technology teams typically are more advanced, uh, whereas kind of customer service teams are typically the least advanced, right? And, and you see people who went from managing kind of entirely manual operations to then becoming almost like a, a chatbot manager, uh, if you will. So I, I think uh, culture is a, a critical point. Um, it, it starts by understanding kind of the baseline of, of where the organizations are today and, and kind of their the comfort with, with deploying technology. And, um, you know, I think some companies are, have a lot of comfort and they can start to deploy these things directly on their own. Um, but in other cases, right, uh, you know, we will support them or, or one of our kind of certified partners would also support in terms of the implementation. Vinay, how do you think about uh, culture maturity? Obviously, you did it at LexisNexis, but as you have been working with customers of SCAN and probably co-working with uh, Laie and a number of other kind of, uh, you know, complementary technologies, uh, what have you noticed? Yeah. Um, so we have uh, been seeing, uh, you know, at the heart of uh, the success with automation or any kind of transformation, uh, especially when you bring in uh, enabler like scan with process intelligence and data driven approach. Uh, the big aspect is around change management, uh, not only in terms of enablement and looking at um, how to embrace a data driven mindset. It is also about how to look at people process technology driven change. 
and planning for that change from the start, how to take people along with um, the change. Because most of the times employees resist the, any kind of change introduced by either a data-driven platform like SCAN or uh, automation platform like Lai. Um, so addressing that change heads on becomes very critical from an overall culture standpoint. And the second is the whole process mindset. Most of the times uh, I've seen enterprises deploy automations um, uh, very in a in a brash manner or they just rush into it but ultimately they realize that the underlying processes are not standardized and then not you come back to the back and change the date awesome. sorry uh, i think there was somebody speaking okay so uh, ultimately it's about trying to focus on process excellence process standardization and optimization before embarking on any kind of um, digitization or automation so these are the two big pillars i think from a culture standpoint that every enterprise will have to continue focusing on as they move into 2023. That makes a lot of sense. And I, and I think a lot of the customers here uh, or just people even um, interested in the space is, you know, you both talked about implementation uh, as a key thing. I, I think onboarding, and we have so many global participants here um, or with divisions in, in various parts of the world. How do you guys think about onboarding in the various regions to those points you guys just made about the, that maturity piece of it? Because I'm sure some parts are, are stronger than others. Some divisions are, are much more ready. Um, you know, with the customers that you guys have worked with so far, maybe uh, talk a little bit about the challenges of onboarding and, and what are things that they can look out for and, and think in advance, right? It's not just the maturity and being ready for it, but um, I'm sure there's hiccups along the way and, and they'd love to hear some of those stories. Sure, um, I can go first and then Brian, you can. So for us, um, um, and uh, Simon, you touched upon a very good aspect, whether it is, are they ready for change and what level of maturity um, the customer is in before they adopt emerging technologies. So for us, it has been more about education as a part of onboarding. And uh, universally, um, when we, if you go back uh, maybe a few months or maybe more than a year, we were all very focused on offering our product and helping customers to realize the value. But slowly we have shifted to understanding how to enable the customers to see the larger value and helping them to be successful more than implementing SCAN as a technology, we want them to achieve the larger success. And that is where we want to focus on onboarding because onboarding is not just about deploying the technology, training, enablement, but it's more about trying to make uh, our customers proficient in the end-to-end -end methodology. That includes not only giving them all the toolkits and help them to be successful, but making sure uh, that they don't fall um, or like, you know, they don't face any kind of pitfalls, repeated mistakes. And that is where uh, we also focus on the right roles and responsibilities, methodologies, giving them the complete toolkit templates and best practices from a governance standpoint. So it becomes a more holistic approach. And um, from the start, we help our customers to think like a center of excellence, establishing core capabilities before you just focus on just implementing a technology. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think one of the points Vinay made uh, earlier as well is around the kind of change management aspect. And, and typically what we see is, um, that there is usually already some sort of transformation program, you know, within an organization to um, better uh, design the claims process or to better manage um, parts of the business. And, um, and 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 the technology piece, you know, usually is one of the pillars of that of that process, right? And and that's really where where LIA can come in to help sort of drive some of that that implementation and change. So, um, you know, we we do some of our own implementation, as I mentioned but also then work closely with partners. Uh, in terms of like geolocations, I would say that we focus primarily on Europe and Southeast Asia with a, with a smaller presence um, in, uh, in the Americas. Um, but at the same time, right, much of this is SaaS technology and can be deployed and managed from a variety of different places. Um, and so it, it really becomes, you know, part of that kind of enablement journey that um, that Vinay was talking about, which is, is quite similar when it comes to automation as well. Makes a ton of sense. And, and I think when you guys both touched on, I think, um, was around the, the notion of productivity and ROI in, in various different ways. Um, 
Yeah. You know, uh, maybe uh, one question before we get to, to Tom's is is really when we're thinking about, especially in this recessionary environment, and 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 sourcing the right solution, and really thinking about you know the implementation things that you guys talked about. How should you know customers think about the value prop that you guys are are are, are bringing, and and how quickly can they can they resonate with the ROI, right? I, I think we, we saw some of the chatbot flows, we saw some of the case studies that me and Brian, you guys both brought on. Um, you know, whichever one wants to go first, uh, I'd love to hear kind of how your customers have been being able to see the ROI and then being able to quantify it very quickly, especially in light of, you know, I'm sure as everyone here is facing uh, some, some budgets uh, decisions for 2023. Yeah, I can go first, Brian, if it's okay. Please. Uh, yeah. So again, uh, value is at the heart of um, every technology implementation, especially when you look at uh, either uh, automation that Brian was mentioning about, or it's about uh, process intelligence, which is a precursor to transformation initiatives. And um, uh, for SCAN, it has become like um, uh, a key go-to-market and customer enablement approach in terms of how we deliver customer value management. So one of the approaches we have taken is um, helping our customers to navigate this as a journey all the way from value discovery to value-centric design to finally uh, bringing uh, a validation around what we set to achieve as a value parameters. And we have been focusing on core efficiency and effectiveness outcome-based value. But below these broad categories like efficiency and effectiveness, uh, we have been uh, drilling down into looking at uh, you just can't say that I'm improving the turnaround time for a customer because it might not mean anything if you just improve the turnaround time. What does it finally mean in terms of cost reductions, imp impact on profitability? What does it mean in terms of customer experience or net promoter score? What does it mean in terms of revenue and revenue cycle time improvement? Or it could be employee experience and engagement uh, or training time reduction. So ultimately, our focus is shifting from pure efficiency to more of effectiveness metrics and that has been uh, one of the big changes that we are able to drive in our customers' appreciation of core value. Yeah, I think um, it, it all makes a lot of sense and it's, it's quite similar, right? So at, at LIA, we, we're probably a little bit more still focused on the kind of traditional efficiency, efficiency matri uh, metrics um, around like reduction in average um, manual handling time. So if there's an existing process, okay, how can we reduce the amount of, of handling time in that process? If it's something that's more chat related and the goal is around deflection, right? There were a thousand conversations coming in a day. Now there's 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 two hundred, um, and 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 then in, in enhancing that quality of work and kind of retraining the the staff to kind of focus on the more high value cases. Uh, in, in in both situations, um, you know what we seek to target is is of course maintaining or enhancing the quality, right? So so there's kind of a few tip, typical metrics. Uh, reduction in average uh, manual handling time, um, the deflection rate, the the process quality, and then typically what you will see if you're able to reduce the manual handling uh, time and also connect your uh, digital workers, you'll also see that turnaround time and overall processing time go go down significantly. Um, and and you know we look to to try and achieve ROI for our customers within a year um, because it's uh, oftentimes consumption based. Uh, uh, in terms of the the usage, um, you you ultimately um, you don't have to to shell out a ton of cash up front in order to get started. You can kind of get started at a relatively low cost, and then and then ultimately um, look to to uh, uh, ensure that you've achieved your ROI within twelve months. Awesome, thank you, Brian. I'm uh, Vinay. Um, Tom, I know we we uh, we saw your question, but given that we're at the top of the hour and everyone needs to start dropping off, uh, we'll follow up with your question uh, directly from with the participants, um, and we'll, they'll have to reach out to you. But again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ryan and Vinay, for for taking the time to share kind of uh, you know how automation can really help uh, productivity um, as we head into 2023, which is top of mind with everyone thinking about how to improve their teams. Um, on that front. Thank you everyone for, for sharing with us an hour and um, we'll, uh, we'll be back with another one soon in early 2023. Cheers. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.